On Select Wednesday nights, we've been looking um, from time to time at the, the Gospel of Matthew and its incredible design and uh, the power of the person of Jesus that we encounter there. And we've been spending some time in the Sermon on the Mount. We want to return there here tonight. And the way that Jesus starts out the Sermon on the Mount is really amazing. It's astonishing because if you feel unimportant, if you are hurting, if you are a person who loves the things that God loves, if you care about the things that God cares about and wish, and you wish to see those things happen in the world, the good news is Jesus says you are precisely the kind of person that God loves. You are the one that God loves, and God is for you. And that's essentially what is being said in the opening section of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus covers the Beatitudes. In verses 3 through 6, he talks about people who are just like what, what we just described. They're in need of seeing the things of God done in their own lives and in the world. And in verses 7 through 9, they in turn then begin to serve the Lord by showing mercy, living lives of purity, and spreading peace to people around them. And in verses 10 through 12, Jesus says, if you live that way, you can rest assured the world is going to persecute you in some way. And so we could summarize those, those opening words, those beatitudes, by saying God really does care about our hurting, that Jesus especially loves those who share his mercy with other people, and that Jesus really does reward those who are despised for his sake. And as we ended that study, we just took a step back and we asked, if you look at all of the Beatitudes, whose portrait really do we see? Who was it that uh, was humble, who thirsted for righteousness above all other things, who was merciful and pure, but was persecuted and reviled for it? Well, in essence, we're talking about the person of Jesus. And he exposes in our lives what's in our hearts. He's conquering evil. He's redeeming people and invites us to be a part of that. And so as we move next into the next section of the Sermon on the Mount, I want to remind you a little bit of Matthew's design because, and especially of the kind of the chronology of Jesus' life, just as Israel went through the waters of the Exodus, Jesus has now come through the waters of baptism. He's been through the wilderness wandering for 40 days, just as Israel went through 40 years of, of wilderness wandering. And just like Moses ascended the mountain and gave to the people after that what came to be known as the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments, Jesus now has a a moment where he has ascended a new mountain, and he's now going to give, let's call it a heptalogue, rather than a decalogue. He's going to give a new version of commandments, and there are seven of them rather than ten. And we want to focus uh, tonight on a few of the seven basic commands of Jesus. These are just overviews, uh, just an overview of these commands. But this is where Jesus begins to outline his vision for the way his people are going to live in and change the world around them. Uh, Jesus is big on mercy. And so as, as Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, and also chapter 12, verse 7 will say, Jesus quotes uh, from Hosea 6 and says, I desire mercy and intimacy with God rather than even sacrifice. And so Jesus has set the stage for what's coming next with these commands by saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He says in Matthew 5, 14, if that's you, you are in fact the light of the world and you cannot be hidden. You're, you're going to be that much different from the rest of the world. And as we approach these seven commands, I want, to, I want to think about the nature of the commands of Jesus for a second, very briefly, because the commands of Jesus, they condemn us in a way. We, we look at them and they are demands that carry with them consequences if we don't live them out. At the same time, they convert us because Jesus has an ability with his commands to reach down into the depths of our hearts and to transform us from within. The very first thing Jesus does in his commandments, these seven basic, most basic of his commandments, is... He unfolds his own vision and view 
of how he thinks about the Word of God. And so the first command Jesus gives is the command to revere and to honor and to cherish God's Word, to trust in it. And we should expect no less from Jesus because he is really the living embodiment of the written Word. He's called the living Word, and it's because he's the living, breathing, walking, talking version of what's written in the law. And so you look at Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18. He says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. You know, for, for Jesus, the word of God is to be trusted because it's God who said it. And I'm reminded of the moment of Jesus in his temptation when he was offered that the stones would be turned to bread. And he had answered, you know, man must not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And here in just a moment in his Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 7, 9, he's going to say, which one of you, if his son asked for bread, would give him a stone? And he values the word of God that, that, that we should live by every word of it. It's really important to look at verse 17. He says, I have come to fulfill God's law, not to, to destroy it, to fill it full. That is to give it a proper meaning, proper interpretation, we might even go so far as to say. Jesus is here giving the proper understanding of the will of God. We should expect no less from him. And so if you go back to, to what he says, I've not come to abolish these things. I've come to fill them full with new meaning. And in verse 18, he says, not an iota or a dot. Not, the older translation says not a jot or a tittle will pass from the law. And I don't know if you're aware of what that means. We're talking really about the, uh, in Hebrew, the yod and and um you know, if you look at a letter like the Dalit, there is a, a little hanging um, part, a very small part of the letter. The Yod, which comes to us in our English translations as, as uh, uh, the Jot, uh, was the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So here's what Jesus is saying. Not the smallest letter and not even the smallest part of a letter will pass from the law until it's all fulfilled. And every bit of that is meant to lead us to seeing the face of God. As disciples of Jesus, we cherish every word that he spoke because we know it is going to lead us to be able to come face to face with God. And so to that end, as he gives this revered view of, of the word of God, you look at verses 21 and 22, he says, You have heard it said of old. In other words, I, I've come to fulfill the law. I've come to give it a a fuller definition, a fuller interpretation. So you've heard it said of old this way, but now I'm saying to you the true meaning. He uses an interesting phrase in Greek, ego de lego, meaning, but I, I say. And just think about that, the, the audacity of Jesus to say it's been interpreted of old this way, but I'm saying, who does he think he is? Well, who indeed? Who else could he be? And so as we look at uh, you know, Matthew 28, the end of Matthew's gospel, we fast forward. He says, in the making of disciples, part of that is the teaching of everything that, that I've commanded you. Teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And I think specifically he means, maybe and especially he means, the words of his Sermon on the Mount. So, so if you think just for a minute, how did the faithful Jews think about Torah, the Torah law? Well, they revered it. <laughs> to them, it was the most special. It wasn't just a book. It was the book. And I think we as followers of Jesus, we have to, to have the same approach. It's what Jesus expects of us. So that's the first command. Second command is to live on the principle of kindness and compassion rather than anger. Because anger fuels so many people and fuels broken lives. 
And so if you allow your eyes just to scan down through this next section, in verses 21 and 22, he wants us to avoid anger in order to have good relationships, to live with kindness and fashion in our relationships. And in verse 23 and 24, we avoid anger with our brothers and sisters. And in verses 25 and 26, even our opponents. Let's see him teach it. He says, You have heard it said of those to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you'll be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you're liable to the hell of fire. Anger destroys. And in verse 22, he uses a couple of examples. He uses the word raka. Raka is a word that normally had to do with people that you would look at them and say, you're mentally incompetent. We have all kinds of ways that we say that in our modern society um, with adjectives and, you know, titles we give to people, but that's what raka meant, mental incompetence. And then the other word he uses is moros, which comes over to us in our English language as moron, and had to do with moral incompetence. And so he says we have a type of anger where we lash out and we use these kinds of words. You're mentally incompetent. You're morally reprehensible. We carry this anger towards these people around everywhere that we go. Verse 23, he says, So when you're offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother has anything against you, swiftly leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled and then come and offer your gift. This is astonishing because he says this should take precedence even over being present in worship. And a lot of damage to our lives is averted if we just follow these simple little steps. Well, those are just the first two of the seven commands of Jesus. And we'll put a pin in that and, and table the discussion to continue for later. But I want to just challenge us as we close this study out. Do we really and truly revere the Word of God? And does it hold the kind of place in our lives that it should? And as a result of that, are we living as people with compassion and kindness in our hearts? And we're not fueling anger that so easily destroys.